Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Be in Deuteronomy chapter 4 this morning. I believe that everyone wants to live the good life. Most of us resonate with the sentiment uh, that was given from the wise philosopher and theologian Spock from Star Trek when he said, live long and prosper. But the sad reality is not everyone does prosper in life. In fact, many people don't even know what it would take to live a prosperous life. They spend their days pursuing wealth, pleasure, comfort, power, or fame, only to find out that it didn't deliver what they had hoped it would, even if they happened to achieve those things that they were pursuing. No one has said it better than John D. Rockefeller when He was asked how much money he needed in order to have enough. He responded, just a little bit more. As Christians, however, we know that true prosperity doesn't come through any of those things. True joy and true fulfillment can only come as a gift from God. We live in a broken world that has been corrupted by sin, And therefore, all the money, pleasure, comfort, power, or fame in the world cannot undo the effects of sin in our lives. Yet I submit to you this morning that we still can, while living in a sin-cursed world, live a prosperous life. The key to doing so, though, is to recognize that we are actually living in God's economy. Therefore, only he can give the insight that we need in order to prosper in a broken world. So today in Deuteronomy chapter 4, the verses of our consideration will be verses 5 through 9. And in this text, we will see three sequential steps for prospering in God's economy. So that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to look to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 through 9, to see these three sequential steps For prospering in God's economy, let's read the word of the Lord. Moses is speaking and he says, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we need your help today. I need your help today. The most skillfully crafted words that I can produce will accomplish nothing unless you be in them. So, Father, we pray that your spirit would be active today in applying this word to our hearts, in illumining our minds, giving us eyes to see and ears to hear. Father, I pray that you would help me to speak clearly, having clarity of thought, clarity of speech. pray that you would help me to preach with conviction, Father, I pray, I beg that you would 
prevent me from being an obstacle to understanding your glorious word. Father, please be softening our hearts even now. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The first step that we will consider from our text this morning, the first step for prospering in God's economy is to learn God's word. Learn God's word. God commanded Moses to teach his statutes and judgments, to teach God's word to the children of Israel. This is significant, though, because those to whom Moses taught these things here in Deuteronomy were not the same people who were at Sinai and who received the law originally. In fact, Israel had been in the wilderness for about 40 years, and only three people remained alive who were adults at Sinai when they received the statutes and judgments that Moses is commanding them here So one of the primary reasons that Moses wrote the book of Deuteronomy was to explain uh, God's law to the people, to encourage the people to obey God's law, and to warn about the dangers of disobeying God's law. Essentially, this book is Moses' farewell address and his final sermon to God's chosen people before he would pass from this earth. So he wanted them to learn God's word because it reflected God's covenant faithfulness and steadfast love to them. And it would protect them from committing the same sins that their parents had committed in the wilderness. Therefore, our text opens with these words from Moses. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. These words that Moses preached to the people highlight the importance of God's people learning his word, namely because God actually prescribed it for them. God prescribed that they would learn his word. Uh, Listen, these people had witnessed all of their parents perish Because of their rebellion against God. Because their parents failed to enter the land when Caleb and Joshua told them that it was good and ready for the taking. Because they feared giants more than they feared God. God cursed them and would not enter the promised land that he had uh, promised to give to Israel. But understand something very important. God was not coerced or obligated into revealing himself to that wicked, rebellious, and faithless generation's children. Rather, in a, in a shocking development, God commanded Moses to teach this new generation his statutes and his judgments. What an act of mercy. What an act of grace by the holy God of the universe. To, to do such a thing. He could have left them to flounder in their sin and unbelief. He, he could have forsaken them and turned them over to become like every other nation in the world at that time. Pagans. Yet that's not what he chose to do. Yahweh, the sovereign God, commanded for Moses to teach his word to, his, to this new generation. But all that was left for the children of Israel to decide was what they were going to do with these statutes and judgments that were given to them. This generation did not witness God's deliverance from Egypt through the plagues. Uh, They didn't see him part the waters of the Red Sea. They didn't see the mountain tremble as he delivered uh, the law to Moses and the elders of Israel. Yet they were still responsible to submit themselves to the Almighty God. They were to learn the word that was taught to them. These statutes and judgments weren't to be a burden to them, but rather they were to be seen as a blessing from God. He prescribed it so that they could truly live. In in fact, Moses even said in verse 4 that it was only those who held fast to the living God who were alive. 
Now, how could they continue to hold fast to him without having his revealed will to them? How could the children of Israel continue to hold fast to this God if they didn't actually know who he was? They didn't know what he desired of them. This conundrum reminds me of the Apostle Paul's words in Romans chapter 10 when he said, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Paul goes on to say, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. God commanded Israel to learn his word for their own good. He prescribed it for them, just as a parent who knows what's best for his child might instruct them to do uh, something that they don't want to do. Listen, church, the omniscient God knew what was best for Israel. And what was best it was that they learned his word. Israel was to learn God's word not only because it was prescribed by God, but also because he, had, he designed it specifically to accomplish a purpose. God specifically designed his word to accomplish a specific purpose. Moses made it clear to God's people that if they wanted to prosper in the promised land, this land which they were about to begin the conquest of, they needed God's word to frame up what he expected of them. After all, they weren't inheriting the land uh, because, they were, uh, be- because they had better warriors or superior uh, weaponry. That's not why they were going to overcome the enemies. The sole reason that they were going to be able to overcome the pagan inhabitants was because God would go before them and deliver their enemies into their hand. God was just as capable of removing Israel from the land as he did later on in their history as he was to provide the land for them in the first place. Therefore, if Israel wanted to prosper in the land that God had given to them, they must live in accordance with his revealed will. Once again, this was a gracious gift from God to his people. It was not a burden. God desired for his people to prosper. But in his economy, there's only one way you can prosper. Essentially, Israel was being commanded to hide God's word in their heart so that they wouldn't sin against him. Uh, Listen, the highlighted importance of learning God's word was carried all throughout the Old Testament and even carried into the New Testament. It's, It's not new. In other words, we still have the responsibility of learning God's word if we long to prosper in his economy. There's a reason Moses would say a few chapters later in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, uh, that man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The word of the Lord is more necessary than even the physical needs that we have. Jesus actually reiterated that. He quoted that verse in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, saying, I agree. I agree. This biblical understanding of the importance of learning God's word is what led Paul to tell Timothy this, but continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing of whom you learn them, and that from a child you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, may be mature, thoroughly furnished or equipped for all good works. Paul told uh, told Timothy later on, preach the word no matter how bad the culture gets. It's the only hope the world has. In God's economy. 
As I already mentioned, the psalmist declares that God's people will hide his word in our hearts so that we won't sin against him. Furthermore, Psalm 19, verses 9 through 11, also emphasizes how learning God's word leads to prospering in his economy when it says, The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Listen, we could go on and on and on concerning the, script, the testimony of Scripture to learn God's word. But I suspect that's not necessary this morning. In fact, I stayed in the bounds of well-known passages. Uh, perhaps uh, most people, if not everyone here, knows all the passages that I just mentioned. The responsibility to know God's word, to learn God's word, is not a, uh, some novelty for us. We know them. We know it. We already know the importance of learning God's word. Yet, I ask this question this morning. Do we live as though we believe that it's necessary for thriving as God's people? Does our life reflect the urgency of learning God's word that we, uh, concerning what we know about our responsibility to, to learn God's word? I've lost track of how many times people have used the excuse of not memorizing God's word because it's just too hard to memorize. Indeed, it is hard. But in what world is that a worthy excuse? We're required to do hard things all the time in life. Is the responsibility of learning God's word less worthy or less necessary than those other things? Furthermore, we actually memorize a lot throughout our normal routines. I don't imagine any of you are using a map to get to work or the grocery store. You don't have to look up the times of our services on the church website each week. We memorize cooking recipes, birthdays, phone numbers, our favorite channels on TV, the best hunting and fishing spots the statistics of our favorite sports team, and lyrics to our favorite songs among hundreds of other things that we memorize. And often we do so even without trying to memorize. In fact, most of us have even memorized the very pew that we sit in during Sunday service. <laughs> But some might argue that these things are fundamentally different, so it's not a fair comparison. I'll give you that. It's not a fair comparison. It's not fair because of two points of difference. First, learning Scripture is far more important than any of these things, and therefore shouldn't even be compared with the things that we already memorize. If you had to decide whether to breathe or go to a Royals game, it wouldn't be a hard decision. What good is going to a Royals game if you can't breathe to get there? It's far more important to learn God's word. That's the first. The second, they're different because we repeat these other things over and over and over again throughout uh, because they're a part of our daily and weekly routines. But I ask, shouldn't memorizing Scripture, as hard as it may be, be a part of that routine also? Wouldn't the repetition of going over a passage again and again and again actually aid us in our efforts to learn God's Word? Yes, I, I know it may take longer than it used to, to memorize passages of Scripture. And yes, you may have to review it later on because you can't remember it as good as you used to. 
But church, learning it slowly and painstakingly is better than not trying to learn it at all. We're told in Scripture to redeem the time that God has given us on this earth. And I tell you, learning Scripture is far more redeeming than almost anything else that we can spend our time on. I also think it's important to state the fact that it's so hard to memorize Scripture because our sinful flesh hates God's Word. Of course, it's going to be difficult. I suspect there are even some who are thinking uh, right now of tons of excuses as to why you are an exemption from the responsibility to continually and systematically learn God's Word. But listen, you want an excuse because your flesh wants nothing to do with putting forth effort in order to learn and memorize Scripture. It's high time that we wrestle our flesh into submission and commit ourselves to learning God's Word, no matter how difficult it may be. It's required of us if we plan to thrive in God's economy. Yet, as you all understand, learning God's word is not enough. And this brings us to the second step for prospering in God's economy, which is to obey God's word. You must obey God's word. Listen, if you think learning God's word is hard, you just wait until you start trying to obey it. It's one thing to know Psalm 145. It's another thing to live out Psalm 145. Our passage goes on to say, Therefore, keep and do these statutes and judgments. God didn't just give his law to the children of Israel so that they would know what he expected of them, but also in order for them to do what he expected of them. In in other words, as God's people take the first step Uh, of learning his word, they must then also begin this second step of obeying what they're learning. The text says obedience is necessary because because it is the only source of wisdom for mankind. Moses said, this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. What would mark Israel apart as a nation, a a great nation among the heathen, was their observance of God's statutes and judgments. They weren't going to be known for their military prowess or their rich resources, even though God did grant those things to them for a time. But rather, they would be marked by his divine wisdom and the understanding that they would glean from it. God's people, when they would obey his word, would be so shaped by it, so transformed, that they would become a living witness to the surrounding nations. In fact, this was part of the responsibility that God had given to Israel, namely that they would bless the nations by being a light to them. The watching world would, uh, was to see that the very essence of and the very source of of wisdom is found in living in accordance to the revealed will of the one true God. The God of Israel. The true God. A clear example of this was when Solomon sat upon the throne of Israel and the rulers of the world would come flocking to him to see the wisdom that he ruled with. Indeed, God's word is the only source of true wisdom, and you cannot live in wisdom without remaining within the confines of God's revealed will. To live any other way is not wisdom, it's foolishness. Additionally, living in accordance with God's word is also a special gift. It's a special gift. Living a life full of purpose and direction due to God's special revelation to his people would leave the rest of the world longing for what Israel had. 
Moses highlighted this reality in verses 7 through 8 where he said, For what nation is there so great who has, the, has God so nigh to them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? It's incredible. By obeying God's word, the children of Israel demonstrated just how near the transcendent God is. Specifically, near to his people. You see, Israel didn't need to guess as to what they had done when God was angry with them. Israel knew who the true God was. They knew what he expected from them, and most graciously, they knew what needed to be done to placate his divine wrath when it was directed on them. Verse 7 and 8 might seem strange to us, though, in terms of how they reveal such a special gift and a high privilege for God's people. It just doesn't quite land the same today as it would have in the context that it was written. So, a helpful exercise to bring us up to speed as to how big of a deal this was, how big of a deal this is, would be by reading a portion of the Prayer to Any God, which is an excerpt that was found in a library in Nineveh from the 7th century BC. This prayer reveals that the pagans were tormented by their ignorance. Whenever misfortune befell them, they were certain that it came about because the gods were angry at them. They knew that they had done something to make the gods angry at them. And they knew that they must do something to make things right for the god that they anger. The only problem is, they didn't know which god they offended. They didn't know what they did to offend that god. And they didn't know what needed to be done for restitution with that god. Listen to this excerpt from that prayer. This is just a small sampling of this long prayer. O oh God, whoever you are, many are my wrongs, great my sins. O oh Goddess, whoever you are, many are my wrongs, great my sins. I do not know what wrong I have done. I do not know what sin I have committed. I do not know what abomination I have perpetrated. I do not know what taboo I have violated. A Lord has glowered at me in the anger of his heart. A God has made me face the fury of his heart. A goddess has become enraged at me and turned me into a sick man. A God, whoever he is, has excoriated me. A goddess, whoever she is, has laid misery upon me. When I wept, they would not draw near. When I would make a complaint, no one would listen. I am miserable, blindfolded. I cannot see. For Israel, everything that marked the pagans' in ignorance was known by them. What a gift from God. They knew because of the statutes and the judgments that he gave them exactly what he expected. And when they sinned against him, they knew what they needed, uh, that they needed a sacrifice to atone for their sins. Through this special gift, the true God has drawn near to his people, making them the envy of the world. No wonder the writer of that prayer was so miserable. His false gods wouldn't even tell him what it was that he did wrong. This was not the case for Israel. They had God's instruction, and they could obey what it said. I, th I wonder, though, when it comes to, God's, comes to obeying God's word, do we see it as a blessing or a burden? We live in a world that's desperate for purpose and meaning. God has given that to us. He has given us a purpose. He has given us meaning. He has drawn near to us. By striving to obey his word, 
we learn that we can't keep it on our own. We learn that we need someone to fully obey it for us. Through, through the scriptures, we learn that God sent his son to obey it on our behalf and to atone for our sins that we have committed. And we learn through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead that we are now free to obey God's law through the power of Christ in us. Christ enables us to do what no one else can do. To obey the word of the Lord. That's certainly not a burden, is it? Surely that's a blessing for us. And because of this, we can now relentlessly pursue obedience. Those who are in Christ will never tire of striving to live a life that's pleasing to God. Right? Those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Isaiah tells us, even when everyone else falls weak, those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. We will never exhaust the power that God has given us to pursue a life that's pleasing to him. Church, as we press on to know God's word better, let's press on in obeying all that it says. Psalm 1 says that the one who delights in the law of the Lord and the one who meditates therein is actually the blessed one. He says that uh, the one who uh, delights in the law of the Lord and meditates therein is like a tree that's planted by a river who brings forth fruit in his season. As the old hymn goes, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. In order to prosper in God's economy, we must learn his word. We must obey his word. And finally, we must evaluate by God's word. We must evaluate by God's word. Verse 9 serves as a necessary warning for us. It says, Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them to thy sons and thy sons' sons. Moses wanted those who were about to start the conquest of the promised land to guard themselves and keep watch over their souls so as not to abandon what they had learned and abdicate their responsibility to obey it. In other words, they were to walk circumspectly. They were to constantly be evaluating their hearts by the standard of the statutes and judgments that God had given to them. For them to successfully take heed to themselves and to keep their souls diligently, they needed to know just what they were capable of doing. They needed to know that their own wicked desires were there. They needed to know that the human mind is so depraved that it was possible for them to forget all that God had done for them and for their people. Their flesh was so weak that they could be guilty of letting the memory of the wonders of God slip through the fingers of their heart and resort to worshiping at the feet of some false gods. That's what they were at risk of if they weren't careful in how they lived. If they weren't constantly evaluating their decisions their actions, their words in accordance to the statutes and judgments of God. Listen, these Israelites were either children or not yet born when God delivered their ancestors from from Egypt. But they couldn't claim ignorance. They could not claim ignorance. For almost their entire lives, they had eaten the manna that was falling from heaven on a daily basis. 
They followed as God led them through the pillar of cloud by day and the fire by night. They had experienced his divine presence by having the tabernacle with them. These people had indeed witnessed God's mighty works, and they were about to witness more as they were gearing up to take the promised land as he would deliver their enemies into their hands, sometimes without drawing a single sword. But they needed to know that none of those experiences and knowing all of those things would be enough to ensure their fidelity and commitment to the one true God. The only way that they could guard against forsaking the living God would be to constantly evaluate their lives on the basis of the very statutes and judgments that they had been taught. They needed to know the word. They needed to live the word. They needed, uh, they, they needed the word of God to search out the hidden sin and unbelief that remained in their hearts. Without a constant evaluation through the word, they would trade the one true God for the false gods of the pagans. Oh, what a tragedy that would prove. To abandon what all the world longs to have for what the world does have. Oh, what a tragedy. Yet the same is true for us. We might not run the risk of bowing down at the feet of some statue, but how easily our hearts cling to the things other than the Lord our God. How easy it is to worship at the feet of our children or our grandchildren, to love sports or money more than God. How quickly we cling to pleasure or comfort rather than doing the hard things of obeying God's word and learning it more. How readily we are to get puffed up in pride when all things seem to be going our way, or how quickly we erupt in anger when they don't seem to go our way. All of those things reveal idolatry of the heart. Friends, we must guard our hearts. We must keep our souls diligently. The only way that we can be sure to remain and grow in faithfulness is by constantly evaluating our lives against the backdrop of Scripture. Uh, James, the half-brother of Jesus, said, We are to look at ourselves through the lens of the perfect law of liberty and change in light of what it reveals. Jesus himself says that his true disciples will abide in his word. There is no other way to protect ourselves from abandoning the faith. We need to evaluate ourselves against the backdrop of Scripture. For Moses, this warning to self-evaluate by God's word was more than just a call to walk circumspectly, though. It was also a call for God's people to create a legacy of doing so. You see, if we follow these three steps, if we learn God's word, if we obey God's word, and if we evaluate by God's word, but we fail to teach our children and our grandchildren to do the same, we have failed to prosper in God's economy, and we all have proven that we didn't actually follow steps one or two either. Israel was only one generation away from abandoning their faithfulness to God in exchange for idols. Church, we are only one generation away from abandoning and forsaking the living God. Moses saw this as such an important element of godly living that just two chapters later, he gave what has come to be known as the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, 
And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them upon the post of your house and on your gates. This legacy of faithfulness is important. I fear, generally speaking, that this present generation of parents is more concerned about helping their children excel in sports than they are in creating a legacy of learning, obeying, and self-evaluating by Scripture. Getting your son or daughter a full-ride scholarship might certainly set them up to succeed in this present world. But if you do so at the expense of adherence to the Word of God, consider the eternal cost of that decision. We must create a legacy of faithfulness to God and His Word above all else. We don't want to teach our children to gain the whole world and thereby lose their souls. Furthermore, if we commit ourselves to creating a legacy of faithfulness by teaching our children and our grandchildren the things of Scripture, it will also keep God's holy word before us as we teach it to them. To teach it is to know it and revisit it. Doing so will also keep us accountable to it. As our progeny hear what we are teaching them, and then they get to watch as we strive to live out what we're teaching them. What an accountability system that's built into this. Listen, there is no more noble of a legacy to leave than that of faithfulness to the sovereign God and his word. We must keep the word of God as the standard by which we live all of our life by. These three steps sound so simple, don't they? (laughs) For anyone who's actually tried to, to consistently and systematically follow them, you know that there is nothing easy about these steps. The struggle, however, will be worth it. When our divine appointment to appear before Almighty God comes, and it will come, and when we stand before Him, Oh, how sweet it will be to hear those words, Well done, my good and faithful servant. That glorious day is not the only reason we must stay in the fight now, though. The undeniable testimony of Scripture says that no matter how difficult the battle is, we can and will experience the joy of the Lord in the midst of our struggle. It seems so counterintuitive for us since we are living in a feelings-driven culture. How can doing hard things bring joy to us? They're hard. We don't like hard. But the obvious answer is because it pleases the Lord. He doesn't command us to consider it all joy when we encounter various trials because he wants us to do the impossible. Rather, he commands it to us because he provides the very joy that we are to have. In fact, that's why joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit. It's produced in us by God. So, as we face another week full of hard things, I commend you to make the time to learn God's word this week. To obey God's word this week, and to evaluate your life in accordance with God's word. And I promise you, a prosperous life lay ahead. But remember, prosperous doesn't mean easy. For some, however, you might be in a period of life when things seem to be going quite smoothly. You know, this is, this is good for others, but uh, things are going well. <laughs> Listen closely. 
if that's you today, if things are going smoothly for you today, I want to warn you that you are actually in most danger of drifting from these principles. We all need to understand that it's actually easier to want to learn, obey, and evaluate during the hard times because we're motivated for things to change. So be warned and don't grow complacent because of the season of fruitfulness that you're in. This is actually what got Israel in trouble later on. They were in times of prosperity. They overtook the land. And then they relaxed in their observance of the law. And before they knew it, they ended up worshiping at the feet of false gods instead. Let's learn from Israel's example. And lastly, you need to know that it's impossible to truly par- prosper apart from Jesus Christ. Until we drink from the springs of living water, you can't be satisfied by what the world has to offer you. It sounds crazy, but true joy will never come until you come to the end of yourself. Until you stop pursuing it for itself. Therefore, if you have found yourself chasing after prosperity in all the wrong places, I challenge you to repent of that wicked lifestyle. Run to Christ by faith and live for Him alone. And if you'd like to do that, but you need to talk further about it, please come and find me or any other member of this church. We would love to show you from God's word what it takes to be born again, what it takes to prosper in God's economy. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you again for your word, for your faithfulness to us, for not abandoning us to try to figure out just exactly what it is that you want from us, why we are living under your wrath. Father, thank you for your steadfast love, for sending Christ when we were still sinners, who no merit of our own, gloriously granting us faith and repentance. Father, I pray that you would motivate us because of these truths to learn your word, to obey your word, and to constantly evaluate our lives up against it. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.